just a little bit. Hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to TWR Facebook Live. Uh, I am very happy to be here this morning. Uh, the Professor David Presti uh, from the Berkeley, the University of California. So I will first of all I'll ask David to maybe um, kind of please say a little bit about yourself, your work your research uh, at the un work at the university and then I have some questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. It's a, it's a real privilege to be here with you and, and uh, share in our conversation with, with you folks all over the world. Very impressive. Uh, so my name is David Presti. I've been teaching at University of California in Berkeley for uh, about 27 years now and I'm in the biology, molecular biology department and also teach in the psychology and cognitive science programs. And ever since I was uh, pretty young, my interest has been nature of consciousness, mind, reality, uh, and how we can better address those questions from uh, the perspective of modern science and also how learning about that might contribute to uh, uh, making the world a better place in various ways, reducing suffering. Uh, and I, I started out in physics and mathematics and chemistry and then evolved into biology and psychology and uh, my, my interest continues to be, you know, what can we say about all the discoveries in neuroscience and brain science uh, and brain chemistry uh, and how is that relevant to deepening our appreciation for who we are as conscious beings and how we connect with the rest of what we call reality. Wonderful. And also, uh, you know, the important part is that David is also not only a scientist and doing science but also he's been a practice, practicing for a long time so definitely have that background. <laughs> it's been a privilege to learn from you in, you. in this thank area. Thank you. Um, so, so basically, maybe um, just maybe we can start a little bit from from wider conversation, uh, science and religion in general sense. That how 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 where where they come together, where they are apart from each other, and maybe specifically like um, Buddhism and science. There's a a lot of uh, folks are doing research and on meditation, how the mind is affecting the body. So maybe talk a little bit about the body-mind, uh -huh. that area. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, you know, this is, uh, uh, these are complicated, big questions like the nature of what is science, what is religion, and many people have very strong opinions about these things. Um, I think these are all these, these are all ways of of making sense of how we see the world, uh, and uh, people talk about religious worldviews and so forth. And science is also a worldview. You know, science is a particular way we have of understanding reality, so-called reality, that is uh, very successful in the way that it has allowed us to organize a bunch of information, material, facts, observations, uh, and allow us to create a way of understanding things that has given rise to all kinds of technology, like the technology that allows this to be happening <laughs> right now. I mean, that's a product of science. So no matter uh, what kind of other worldviews one might hold, there's a way in which the worldview of physical science, biological physical science, has been uh, obviously successful uh, so uh, but in the in the final analysis all of these perspectives are trying to help us understand who we are and uh, how we fit in with everything else and so I think it's uh, although many people talk about some kind of schism between say religious worldviews and scientific worldviews uh, many people also believe that this is a very productive uh, interface to explore and that uh, to uh, 
take everything, uh, everything that can be empirically, uh, everything that shows up in the world in some kind of empirical way over and over again, to take that seriously sure. and to try to see how that might be incorporated into an expanded understanding of the world that may be more helpful to mm -hmm. us than what we have right mm -hmm. now. So maybe <clears throat> maybe we can uh, talk a little bit about um, you know last uh, ten days and uh, all our audience here, many of them are been practicing for last ten days and uh, this meditation, uh, working with their pain and either is the physical or their emotions. And uh, there were I've been reading so many beautiful comments about people saying. My pain is gone, <laughs> or my pain is fifty percent gone, or I don't know if I'm uh, not not anymore paying too much attention. It, I don't. I, it doesn't affect me anymore. So basically, uh, in a way, you look at okay, well, you know, they're having good experiences with meditation. But on the other hand, I think it's a, quite a big deal. I feel I think it's a big deal. There, are billions of dollars are uh, spent on pain management. And, and around the world, and uh, so if there is some way that people can uh, find a way with their own power of their own mind and power of their own awareness, able to reduce some, able to handle their situations by themselves without any side effects, I think it's a very, very. I feel it's a very, very important. No, yes. so so can you say anything? Um, What's happening <laughs> from your perspective? You can say anything. <laughs> if you feel free to say what's happening. If, if um, how the mind is affecting, how the brain is affecting those pains. Basically. Well, I don't know really. I, 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 we, what we do know is that that uh, effects of the mind. If if we if we call by mind all of those activities of uh, thoughts and feelings and perceptions and our awareness of things, uh, we know that this, these things are extremely potent, extremely powerful in, in everything, you know, how we see the world and, and uh, how we interpret signs from our own body and all of this. And uh, we know that there are very powerful effects on different beliefs, uh, uh, so-called placebo effects, which often is used in a kind of negative way. You know, it's just a placebo effect, but placebo effects are among the most profound and powerful things we have. That is, there's some kind of mental belief or change that is mediating a very powerful physical phenomena. And we have very little understanding yet about what's going on there. And that's also what makes this discussion here and the larger interest in this interface between modern science and practices like meditation practices to research these things, it also makes it very interesting because this is perhaps something that can be more specifically studied. Mm, sure. Because I think for most of these things we have very little answers. I mean, for example, for pain, we know that one of the ways the body regulates in the perception of pain is through uh, the release of a particular kind of chemical, or class of chemicals that are called the endogenous opiates or the endorphins. Mm -hmm. And it, it has been shown that uh, you know, if you take a pill that you believe is a pain pill, uh, even though it doesn't have any active chemical in there, uh, that that will facilitate the release of these endorphins by your own body. Uh, and Even though it's not the right medicine it's not the it, it should but not we, be doing that yeah it's, okay. exactly okay. by any known mechanism sure. but somehow just the belief that it will do that that it will lessen pain causes the release of these internal chemicals and the pain goes down maybe something like that is happening in meditation in these in the meditative practices uh, and that would be profound if that's if that's happening and inexplicable right yeah. now so I think there's a kind of two things right <clears throat> I was <clears throat> I was um, sharing with you before the, the study of at Harvard, about 30,000 people who are interviewed if they experience the stress. So, so and uh, most of them, people who said they experience the stress, 
and uh, and then they also ask if the stress is good for you or not and there are some people say yes some people said no over the eight year period of time afterward they, when they look at the death record public death record and the people who not people who have the stress not necessarily affected they're not uh, premature death but people who believed the stress is not good for you they have been affected so in some sense basically what it's saying stress as itself it does not do anything necessarily bad for you it, it doesn't become the cause of your premature death but if you believe it's not good then it does so it has something to do with the belief mm -hmm. right so the other example you know I, I remember one of the conferences that I went I think I not, I'm not sure you were there or not they were talking about the perception of the mountain so if you're looking at the mountain uh, the height of the mountain increases or decreases depends on how much weight you are carrying on your back. If you're carrying a heavy bag, bag and you're looking at the mountain, the mountain immediately goes higher. You take out of your bag, mountain goes down. So some sense of perception of the mountain is changing for you. I, th I thought all, when they talk about all those things, I thought it's really, really interesting. It's not what you're perceiving, what you're seeing, it's really more issue about who is seeing it, as you are saying. And in, in the end, I think all these things should help to understand ourselves better, who we are. No? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that the study should be a little bit more, not the objective sense of what you perceive, but more like a subjective of sense of your perception of self. Mm -hmm. How that can change through this meditation. Yes. Right. Yes. And that's a place. Can it be changed, and how it can be changed? Right. Yes. Yeah. Good points. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where, again, where modern science uh, has a lot of room to expand. You know, uh, we have hundreds of years of history, several centuries of, of history doing uh, biophysical science in a particular way that kind of uh, assumes that the person can be removed from the situation and we're kind of like looking at the world from the outside and we describe all these atoms and molecules and cells and so forth but of course that's not really what's going on what, what what's going on is that we as conscious beings are wrapped up and folded with this world in a completely inextricable way and uh, the, the science as we've developed it so far which has worked really well has not really given enough attention to that and mm -hmm. so learning more about how to address the self and how this is relating to everything else is a, a really important direction for the future of, of science as we if we hope to deepen our understanding sure. of who we are so let me ask you some a little more question more more specific things for example uh, according to the teachings right so we like if you're talking about the handling the pain for example you look at the pain, you can analyze the pain, you can label it, you can uh, label it negative labels, or you can leave it as it is. Um, so it's, it's for, let me say a more simpler way, concepts, emotions have a different role like thinking mind and the emotions have a different role in relation to the pain, right, to our body. Because we can think about ignorance, we can think about thoughts, we can think about anger, we can, they are different, mm -hmm. right? So their relationship to our body and their relationship to our pain. How, I mean, how does science would uh, see these different emotions having different effects or not? Well, uh, again, I, I'm not sure about the answer to that. What we can say definitively is that different emotional states are uh, represented in the, in the body in profoundly different ways. So there's a very different chemistry uh, in terms of neurotransmitters and hormones and so forth that are, uh, uh, that's released in the case of anger, mm -hmm. say, or fear uh, than there would be in the case of happiness or joy uh, and that those 
those chemicals, you know, are believed to mediate different kinds of physiological responses in the body that perhaps may promote um, a certain kind of wiring in or a certain kind of strengthening of, a, of a, a ways of remembering or dealing sure. with that situation. So, but I think mostly it's mysterious. Though. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think this is interesting. Another study, there was one study where they were saying like a same situation with the stress where people, number of people experiencing the stress, financial, family stress situation in a very, very similar way. But when people who seek help went out with other people asking for help or went out to help other people, they did not, they, they were like a zero premature death in the stress related relation. But others who, people who just experienced the stress but they did not connect with anybody, either seeking or helping somebody, uh -huh. they were the one who have uh, you know, affected by it. Sure. So that sense seems like it seems like emotion, a connection, you know, like a sense of connection is kind of very important. Very important. We are, uh, humans are highly social beings and uh, many mammals are social beings, but humans are particularly so. And, and we've spent hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, you know, evolving certain kinds of of uh, bodily and brain uh, circuitry that really has uh, promoted our connection with one another and our ability to get along with one another and and uh, and absolutely it's a it's a it promotes a sort of healthy set of physiology in our body when we connect with sure. others. Uh, yeah, so some sense of that. I think there were a number of studies where people in Japan. Uh, like people talking of people living a very long life, one of the main thing their their the lifestyle they were living was very much socially connected, and that seems like it have a strong impact on health. Maybe talk about the social connection, maybe how about not connection, but not necessarily always a social connection. I think that's the kind of differences where many people the research and um, different findings they always emphasize so much about the the that the value and uh, the importance of uh, well-being in social connection, the connection of social. I had to completely understand that. I, I, I really, really believe it's invaluable. But what about like the other connection in a spiritual sense, people like uh, people practicing is not a connection to somebody, but a connection to yourself. You sit like a Zen meditator mm -hmm. sitting right in front of the big blank wall they're not trying to look at anybody. Maybe as a monk, not even have any relationship with anybody. Mm -hmm. Just the wall is there and mirror is there. It's representing yourself. You're trying to connect to that mirror, to that, in the sense of you're trying to connect with yourself. This is not a social connection. What about effect of those kind of things? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's certainly doing something. But even, even the monk is is uh, probably part of the Sangha, you know, where... where no, yes, where, part of... Monk <laughs> is part of the Sangha, but in those form of meditation, they're not socializing. Uh -huh. They're not really socializing. They're not... In a way, they're not supposed to socialize. Right? That so, so they are trying to... But they're trying to connect. Uh -huh. And that's the important part. So when they know every every single med deeper meditation, they're... Constantly trying to be aware, am I losing the connection? Am I still connected? And that's the, their lifetimes kind of practices, right? So they're there, but that connection is something that has to do with themselves. Uh -huh. With has nothing, in a way, not really nothing to do with the social connections, you know. Uh -huh. So I think uh, uh -huh. it's interesting, you no? Know? Oh, it's absolutely yeah. interesting, and I'm sure it's it's all good. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, of course, again, the, in terms of talking about the research, there's so much more in in that area, you know, like uh, we were talking earlier that this sense of connect, holding hand of stranger, holding hand of somebody you are in relationship but not married, holding hand of somebody you not only have a relationship, you're married, you're settled, and just each of these different holding hands, they're saying different signals 
in the brain. Mm -hmm. I think that was really interesting. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. For sure. Mm. I think there's a lot there's a lot going on uh, in our bodies and in our brains. And I, I like to think of the body brain as one kind of yeah. unit. It's not like we can take our brain out and it's going to be it certainly didn't develop independently of the body. You know, it's all uh, an integrated organism and also completely interconnected with the environment and with other people. So there's a lot going on in our brain and our body that is related to all kinds of different aspects of connection. So the fact that all these different ways of, uh, of touching somebody, depending upon what one's relationship is, creates different kinds of signals or that can be measured in the brain is makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. I think, from the perspective of, of uh, neuroscience and psychology and uh, just because our our brains have spent so much time uh, developing the capacity to connect uh, you know humans have relatively speaking large brains compared to you know the body size if you compare us to a lot of different animals and Nobody's quite sure, you know, how that came about or what it means. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. And it took, uh, you know, a million or a couple of million years for this to happen. And uh, often folks will say, you know, humans really weren't doing much until just a few thousand years ago. And then we sort of... But it seems like saying more neuron in size of human brain than any other brains, right? In uh, prop maybe. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, but uh, you know there are other animals that have very complex brains, like whales and dolphins and elephants. But they have bigger brains. They're bigger brains. Yes. We have only one kilo and a half or something. We have we have Small. very densely packed material, yeah. and so one question is like, since we all of our science and all of our all the you know the art that we know about and so forth and our agriculture and civilization, this all came about only in the last few thousand years. So what were we doing for the previous million years? Uh, and uh, it makes a lot of sense to, to, to hypothesize that what we were doing was we were learning how to get along with one another. We were, sure. Our brains were developing, they were evolving, they were developing these rich sense of, sets of neural circuitry in order to help us connect yeah. and be social beings. Yeah. Also, it seems like even the, our whole cooking food or eating more, f eating more concentrated fat calories is also saving more time because brain seems like a human brain seems like it need a lot of calories than comparing to the others, right? Well, it needs a lot of calories. I'm not sure how we compare to other animals, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, our brains are cows are uh, they eating eight nine hours, or we need only <laughs> one burger. <laughs> <laughs> one big one, yeah. double burger. <laughs> so let's Veggie go. Burger. Maybe yeah. Maybe let's go <laughs> talk a little bit <clears throat> this um, about sleep. So again, I think the question it comes again is the same way. There's a, in according to like a dream yoga and the sleep yoga practices, so that ability to be lucid and conscious in your dream, and ability to change your pattern of your uh, mind uh, uh, in, in the way you want it rather than where, 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 where the addiction and patterns are going. So ability to change that. So I mean according to the science or neuroscience in brain, I mean all this is possible or not. But we, we have some experiences with that, right? But I don't know all this is uh, what it means to for neuroscientists, you know. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, that's profoundly interesting stuff. Uh, uh, of course, uh, as we know, one of the one of the aspects of meditation is about is about developing a certain kind of focus that allows one to move their mind in ways that they would like uh, and stay focused there um, and. Folks have been practicing how to do that while they're awake. Mm -hmm. The idea that you could do this while you're asleep too is really fascinating. Um, and we spend roughly a third of our lives asleep. So that's a lot of time, uh, and many years of time cumulatively. And, and if that could be applied to developing and practicing uh, in ways that 
folks do while they're awake. That's pretty interesting. And so uh, I know there are texts that talk about sleep and dream yoga. And often when that's presented, it's done in the context of, uh, say, lucid dreaming, you know, where you can perhaps learn to become aware during a dream uh, and then incline your mind and your thoughts and feelings in particular ways. Uh, and that you could do this even when you're not dreaming, during sure. non-dream sleep is really an interesting question. There's nothing, there's nothing that would be preventing that from anything we know about sleep neuroscience. We know that the brain is incredibly active during sleep uh, as active. Maybe, as maybe more like a specific question will be again. So for example, uh, I, I read a little bit in your book. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, I know like Anya is going to uh, post the David's uh, book um, there. And uh, David says it's a much more accessible for everybody. I still find it hard to understand everything. And uh, very difficult for me, <laughs> not having any background. But I think uh, it, uh, uh, David saying it's accessible for everybody. And so I would uh, highly uh, recommend. And uh, I think Anna is, uh, Anya is going to send a link there. So I know like you know, when we show this, this comes the upside down there. You know? uh -huh. <laughs> it's not really that hard. You know, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll help you with that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So maybe let's go back to, um, so for example, needing a certain amount of sleep, like eight hours of sleep, everybody, average, everybody needing eight, eight hours of sleep. And uh, when you are doing dream yoga practice or when you're doing the sleep yoga practice, you are in a, in a sense that you are quite a conscious, uh, quite a active, uh, quite a engaged in guiding activity of your mind. Uh, emotions. Does those lucid dreaming events uh, affect your restfulness of the sleep? Well, my, my guess would be it does. Uh, that in general, uh, what's happening in our mind during sleep uh, has a big impact on the restfulness of the sleep. I mean, sleep from the perspective of, <clears throat> of modern uh, psychology and neuroscience is, is is only beginning to be, I think the, the research in this is really beginning to really pick up momentum and expanding, but it's relatively new compared to a lot of other things, but everything we're learning about the period of sleep is really interesting and important mm -hmm. uh, about how essential it is. It's not just uh, uh, downtime where the body is not doing anything. Brain is very active. It's active in some ways that are similar to when we're awake and some ways that are different. And uh, yeah, we know <clears throat> over the last few years there's been an increasing amount of research that shows that uh, restful sleep is important for helping to lock in new learning that's happened during the day uh, and also to eliminate maybe connections between the neurons that are not that essential because we can't always be making new connections between the neurons forever. Yeah, it yeah, just... yeah. So maybe the question is here, it's like uh, I, so you're basically saying it does affect so that you, you you're telling don't do the dream yoga practice so you're not getting rest, <laughs> just joking. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like you're saying that, right, or no? Why would I be saying so that? You, so you're saying that if you are doing the dream yoga practice, trying yeah. to basically, some in a negative way, somebody might say you're manipulating, if you, ah, okay. or some somebody might uh -huh. say you're guiding, if you're going uh -huh. to look in a positive way, but uh -huh. you are still doing something, does that prevent the restful, and the, you're not getting amount of rest for your brain necessary rest? Well, both, I mean, that's an interesting question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I, there's been... Uh, only a little bit of research that tries to look at you know some of the things that that people who have been doing brain science and meditation for the last few years this kind of research they've found that people who have engaged in a lot of meditative practice <clears throat> they uh, increase the kind of oscillatory activity of their electrical uh, activity in the brain uh, uh, at these higher frequencies with more synchronous uh, activity over the entire brain and that's generally interpreted as being related to positive benefits, positive emotion, uh, 
better capacity to focus attention and so forth. Recently, that's been found to also uh, show up in the sleep of people who mm -hmm. are long-term meditators, which is very interesting that this, uh, what appears to be sort of enhanced, uh, the kind of brain activity that's related to improved memory and attention uh, is showing up also in sleep. Uh, so we don't know what the implications of that. Yeah, that's so I think maybe, positive. maybe, <laughs> Maybe the question goes back to the same question before. So it's not about the activity. It's more about your relation to the activity. It's like the same thing with the stress. When mm -hmm. people are stressed, your heart is pumping. You are you're a little bit in a hole. You're, you're physically, you are agitated. Your heart is pumping. Breath is shorter. But it's saying, that the research is saying, not, that's not necessarily bad. If you see that as an opportunity to transcend yourself uh -huh. and strengthen yourself. So if you, you're having the right relation to the even the heart pumping and short breath, it's good for you. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, even the, the action is bad in a way, but if you have a positive view, attitude to it, then action becomes good. So the same mm -hmm. way in a dream also, uh, I mean, the interesting thing is people many times when we have, a, you know, people feel, I mean, I know definitely I feel that that um, when you're doing some certain activities of sleep and dream, uh, you feel that um, you're weak. Uh, for let's say, if I'm practicing for one hour or taking a nap or something, that I felt I feel like I'm very conscious of many things around me, just my surrounding, my feelings, emotions, activities, even certain dreams. But when I wake up from my practice, I feel so rested, even in some cases more rested than when than I would call I did sleep without having all those experiences. Mm -hmm. That I mean personal experience, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, so so I don't know. I really don't. This is my belief. I don't feel that has anything to do with the activity itself. But you can be totally rested. Uh, having all those activity and brain getting all its needs of resting, even all these activities are happening as long as they are coming from right place. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Uh -huh. mm. And I, I mean, I would take that kind of report that you just uh, that you just related very seriously, and and also perhaps that's consistent with the, what a lot of texts have said over the centuries. Uh, that it's likely that these kinds of practices during sleep will have benefit. Mm -hmm. And just because we know so little about the neuroscience right now, or the, that, that is, this is an idea that can be pursued at that level, and maybe we can understand something about how the brain may be mediating a certain kind of benefit. But if people, like, your, like you just did right now, are relating this kind of thing, I think that's empirical data that deserves, if you're interested in the science, it, it, it's an idea that can be explored then with, with more precise Yeah, sleep and so you know, like when we, when we are having uh, many people practicing, there many people report that, that's interesting, many people report that, they say they felt very, very rested, even though the activities are still happening. That's great. <laughs> yeah, so that's, uh, I think it's interesting. So, uh, so anyway, I think maybe uh, you wanted to say anything, uh, Last uh, conclusion to our audience. Well, I'm, well, I'm very impressed that uh, that uh, you all are out there uh, <laughs> listening to this and interested in this, and I, I'm very excited about the future of uh, uh, of this conversation that has been evolving over the years between contemporary science and. Uh, the, the, not only the Buddhist Bon traditions, but in many different spiritual and religious traditions, I think that this is perhaps one of the most important areas for the future uh, development of of modern humanity. You know that uh, that we can develop a, a more uh, productive relationship and maybe contribute to the development of worldviews that are more integrative of a larger number of perspectives and and more healthy for our interaction as humans and with the environment and so forth um, and uh, and that will deepen our appreciation for 
this profound interconnection, this kind of inextricable interconnection that we have with, uh, with one another and, and with the world as it shows up to us. I mean, it's all kind of mixed together in a way that uh, to the extent that we can take that more seriously, uh, it can only be helpful in appreciating who we are and what's going on. Great. So I wanted to ask our, our audience, wanted to thank and David, give us some thumbs up, <laughs> hearts there. <laughs> and um, we, you know, my intention here is to, you know, all the people who are interested in the same common goal, same common interest, or really like a self discover uh, better. That's all the hearts and thumbs up thank you for you <laughs> this is wild i've never done anything like this so david, this is, david is the first time he, david is a neuroscience scientist i am this ancient burn tibetan lama and i have to introduce him the technology here <laughs> so anyway i you know our intention here is to do to do this uh, to really bring different speakers and uh, different areas of Science is definitely in areas that uh, we all have interest in, and particularly, uh, you know, the practices that what we're doing. And these, I mean, every time science says some new findings and new findings, I don't feel, well, we know that. <laughs> we know that. That's, what is, why is a new finding? We know that. That's how I feel. But of course, on the other hand, it's so nice to hear all new findings because it confirms our conceptual, our rational mind of ourselves, so give us some sense of peace to our rational mind, our, okay, it's not only your emotion, it's just even if science confirms that, you know, so some sense, personally, I find it very beneficial, helpful. I know like many people like myself, there are people who, who, who really appreciate uh, your visit here and, uh, and I definitely hope, uh, to have again sometime in the future and then of course all of you who are watching there if there's any comments specific comments that in the future uh, specific things that you uh, questions or interest or comments whatever you have there please uh, uh, write comments and I will definitely um, read them and also pass on David that and so sometime in the future when we have opportunity we can maybe go a little bit some some more do some more research what new findings are and then talk about some more specific things mm -hmm. into the teachings no yeah yeah, yeah. happy to do that again yeah, great thank, okay. you. thank you thank you thank you <laughs> thank you